Hello once again, everybody. Welcome to Crossing Streams or Soccer's <laughs> Overtime. <laughs> You're crossing your streams, sir. That's what happens when you do so many podcasts. In the same day, too. <laughs> no, not again. This isn't a live show or anything, is it? Oh, no, nah, don't worry about it. We'll edit that out. No yeah, one's watching. Take two. Take two. Hello again, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Soccer's Overtime, your weekly look inside the major arena soccer league in the San Diego Soccers. Coming to you live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash San Diego Soccers. Craig Elston, Jerry Jimenez, your humble podcasters, back assembled for season four, episode 10. And Jerry, we're not furious. We're just disappointed. Very disappointed. I'm so happy to be back here on the Cheeto FC podcast once again with you. All. Oh, wait. <laughs> hey, if you get to plug it, so do I. This is what happened. Fair enough. Fair it wasn't enough, on fair purpose. Enough. Oh, my God. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to uh, Twitch with us once again. Uh, man, we have to laugh about something, Craig. This game did not go as planned, but we're going to get into that. It's good to be back, though. Here we are for, uh, what is this now, episode 10? Of season yeah. four? Wow. Episode right. 10 of the season. It just so happens to be the 99th episode ever of Soccer's Overtime. Hey. Um, okay. yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about next week's round number uh, coming up later in the show. We do have a lot uh, scheduled for you, and we're expecting a whiz-bang podcast and live uh, broadcast here on Twitch and wherever you are listening to us worldwide, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We just stumbled out of the gate. Someone like the soccer stumbled out of the gate in overtime, uh, giving up a goal 29 seconds in uh, and losing to Ontario 8-7. to seven. We are here to break down what happened in Game 2 of the three-game series with Game 3 coming up in Ontario this Sunday afternoon. We'll wrap up the podcast previewing that match. Coming up at 5.30, our special player guest joining us live will be the veteran Brian Farber, who made his season debut on Sunday against Ontario. We'll talk to about, uh, Brian about getting back in the fold, getting healthy again, and a lot faster than he anticipated. Uh, all of that coming up uh, at the bottom of the hour, so stay tuned for that. We've got some good soccer's news to deliver, some news that should be of interest uh, to our top supporters, the folks who are here on a live Soccer's Overtime broadcast, so stay tuned for that after our live interview with Brian. And, of course, we'll take on the latest MASL news as well, including already another coaching change in the MASL Central. Every week we do the podcast and the next day someone gets fired in the Central. Something we can tomorrow. <laughs> you know what's crazy though, Craig, is we've talked about this too, is for whatever reason, you know, we're doing the show. Here we are again, Tuesdays, 5 p.m. News always drops Wednesday morning, 9 or 10 a.m. And we're like, ah, oh, really? So <laughs> it's such a consider Tuesdays podcast. at four for your release. I mean, you know, yeah, Jeez. <laughs> nonetheless, we'll break the, all of that down. It's all coming up on this episode of soccer's overtime, but uh, here with you, Craig and Jerry to get into the nitty gritty of what was definitely a, a, a disappointing game, Jerry. Now, a disappointing game from which we can draw a number of different positives and maybe a number of different uh, operative points for future matches. We will talk through all of that. Certainly the soccer's played well enough for a half to win and then played a half like they were trying not to lose. And quite often in any pro sports endeavor, Jerry, when you play not to lose, you wind up doing exactly the thing you tried not to do. Yeah. No, exactly. And and I'm I'm going to go ahead and say that I did afterwards obviously found I found some positives and we'll go ahead and play some of the uh the highlights here as we're talking about the game, but the, you know you're absolutely right. I, I just think that what 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 can we do is we have to go ahead and move forward, find some positives and move on and hopefully don't make the same mistakes. But there was man, there's just so many things that we can be talking about uh on this game. <sighs> Where do we start? Where do you want to start, Greg? Well, let's start with what was a, a quality first half. You know, the, the Soccers, while they had some great chances, and you just saw, if you're watching our live stream on Twitch, uh, really what 
absolutely should have been the first goal of the game, either from Juan Manuel Rojo or Charlie Gonzalez, both of whom had tap-ins. Uh, instead, you get this incredibly difficult goal by Craig Childs to start things on a half-field service from Mitchell Cardenas that finds Childs' head uh, and then finds side netting. Absolutely incredible uh, what we saw there. Um, and at that point, Jerry, you know, the Sockers give up a goal late in the first quarter. It's 1-1 one, one, uh, after 15 minutes. But San Diego turned up the pressure in the second quarter, saw Christian Gutierrez score a couple of counterattack goals. The defense was strong. And, you know, 25 minutes into this game, it's it's 5-1 San Diego. And I got to be honest, I, I wasn't thinking anything along the lines of, oh, this is going to be a close one at the end. No, not at all. And at that point, it felt really good. And like you said, Christian Gutierrez coming in, you know, one after the other. Uh, we can't. We have to talk a little bit about that Craig Charles goal, though, because I was behind the net, and I just watched him. The, the man can still fly somehow. Puts his head on that ball, like perfectly placed ball into the corner. Uh, Mitchell Cardenas, of course, also doing that that beautiful pass uh, from from quite quite a distance and getting it perfectly to Craig Childs. Uh, and then you have something that I want to talk about too. And I think you are probably going to mention as well, the partnership of Tavoy and Leo, man, fruitful this game as well, going into this game. Absolutely. Leo assists on two different Tavoy Morgan goals. Uh, Leo has three assists overall in the match. And, while there's maybe a, a separate aspect of it that we'll talk about a little later that isn't as positive, moving Leonardo de Oliveira to the midfield means that he's always on the floor with another player who used to play forward in his same position where it would have been either or. So in other words, either Leo or Craig on the floor, either Leo or Tavoy on the floor. And instead you get Leo with Craig, you get Leo with Tavoy. And that's where you get these really magical moments. I think of all the players on the soccers in terms of their offensive game. I think Leo is the guy who's been most on point all season long game one, two, three, and four. No, oh, I agree. Yeah. hundred percent. So, you know, so there's a pause and we're just watching on the highlight right there as he, uh, Undressed Jeff Hughes, took Abdul Mansoure out of the play, set up Morgan for a tap in. Just the spectacular footwork of Leonardo de Oliveira, always worth the price of admission at uh, Pachanga Arena, San Diego. So, a really good first half. Yes, Ontario scores late in the first half. And I'll tell you what, I think that was one of the most important goals of the entire game, Jerry, was to go from 5-1 to 5-2. I mean, it may not sound like much, but if you could have shut out the Fury in that quarter and had a 4-0 quarter, I think it's a different locker room uh, at halftime than it is when you get that one with a couple minutes left in the quarter and then you say, hey, we just got one. All we got to do is go get that next one, and then we're right back in this game. And you know that's what Jimmy Nordberg had to say to his club at halftime. Oh, 100%. You know, there is, yeah, it, I'm still kind of trying to find the words to put this together. I just, it felt like uh, like there was a game plan coming in for Ontario from the beginning. I feel like it was almost the complete opposite uh, of the last game for both teams, right? And yeah. I think going into this, I, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what Jimmy Norberg was saying to them. You know, we, we have to go in here and, and, switch it up on them uh you have somebody like uh like leo and tavoy performing well but you can't have the defense where we've been talking very speaking very highly of the defense as well uh making some some silly mistakes and and especially in the fourth quarter especially in overtime uh we go into it uh and you know jesus pacheco also that goal to make it the two five i mean kudos to him that was that was a, a good goal too it, it was a very nice goal. Um, continuing to talk about some positives, the Sockers did not see Frank Tayu score a goal in this game, second straight game. And and 100%, if you had told me uh, prior to Jan, if you told me on New Year's Day, you know, the next two matches, Frank Tayu will not score a goal. I would have said the Sockers will win twice. Just period, end of story. 
Uh, and the Sockers did not win twice. The Sockers did get points in both games, which is important. And we'll talk about that uh, more a little bit later. But I do think it augurs well overall, Jerry, for the season series and for the season in whole that while Frank Tayu is the most dominant scorer in this league in the history of the MASL and generally has his way with opponents for hat tricks and four goal games against specifically Guerrero, Pino, and Mitchell Cardenas, Frank Tayu has a lot harder time finding the space he usually finds to operate. That is super important for us. Shutting down Frank Tayu is ridiculously important for the rest of the season, I would say. Uh, and you know, he did get a point. He did do the, he did have the assist on Jesus Pacheco, right? That, yes. that, that goal for the two five. So he did have that one assist, but he, to keep him off of the score line, to, to keep him from scoring a goal two games in a row is huge. It's, it's huge. It's, it's almost like, Kate, hey, we've, we have figured him out. He's going to have to adjust. He's going to have to adjust when playing against us especially if we continue to have Guerrero Pino and Mitchell Cardenas covering him. I mean, those two guys have him figured out. You know, in hockey, Frank wouldn't have gotten an assist uh, on the play where he did because it was a Taiyu shot that was saved by Pardo. And then the rebound came out and Pacheco scored it off the rebound. But uh, uh, yeah. in, in hockey, that's shot, save, rebound, score no assist because there wasn't a pass, but here, because there was no possession for Pardo, the assist is allowed to happen. Subject to interpretation, certain markets, I think, wouldn't have given an assist there. Uh, we gave an assist to Frank Tayu, so he's now two points away from 400 MASL points uh, in his career. We just saw in the highlights that you're watching, if you're joining us live on Twitch uh, on our San Diego Soccer's channel, the two counterattack goals by Christian Gutierrez, but Again, as we kind of start with positives, believe me, there's going to be a darker turn to this analysis uh, minutes from now. Yes. Um, Gutierrez is fulfilling his role on the soccer so far impeccably. He is a defender. He is a defender first. You know, he is a power play against player. He is a player that is on after goals uh, in order to try and shut down the opponent. And he is a player who is there to counterattack. And back-to-back -back counterattack goals in the second quarter for Gutierrez, one in which uh, he gets past Clayson DeLima, who had tried to come out to challenge. Another uh, shorthanded uh, on the power play against, where he chipped DeLima uh, quite beautifully, uh, actually. And to have Christian Gutierrez already have four goals this year, spectacular for a, a kid who was averaging like four goals a season as a soccer, I think it is fair to say now that, that it's official. Christian got that confidence from his performance in the playoffs and it's carried over to the next season. We talked about that. We said how important it was going to be to carry some of that into this coming season, especially with the changes in personnel. And here he is, here he is Christian Gutierrez, the one that I would say for me personally was hoping for this, you know, and we're seeing him, already putting numbers up i mean he makes it 3-1 then 4-1 and it's very very important to have somebody like christian gutierrez uh in the team continue to do as good as he has been doing last year and then bringing it in that's just amazing so if you kind of look at the second half of january 2nd and the first half of january 9th you have the picture of a san diego soccer's team that can dominate the ontario fury and, and really bring it to them but if you look at the first half of January 2nd and the second half of January 9th, you see a different picture. You know, you see a Fury team that can slow and sometimes shut down the San Diego attack. But I think more importantly, you saw an Ontario team that was able to find its rhythm in the second half of this game because the soccer's made a tactical change, Jerry, uh, abandoning the pressure formula that had worked for them so well in the second quarter and going to what some of the players described to me as a mishmash in the second half where some players on the floor were still trying to press other players were dropping back communication was being lost and they, they kind of lost the plot defensively. Yeah, no, I could, I could see that. I can see that uh, definitely changing. Was that, was that a planned move? They, were they trying for something or 
was that something that happened just with you know tired legs or did, did they kind of tell you what what was the deal there because you, you know you mentioned it and the more i think about it it just doesn't make sense to me to be honest so a couple of things happened the first thing we have to go back to jimmy nordberg and, and offer a tip of the cap to the ontario fury head coach because the fury made a change at halftime they made the only true tactical change of the match because they took out Clayson de Lima, the 22 year old Brazilian keeper, and they put in Chris Toth and de Lima definitely didn't have a good first half. Uh, certainly you look at the third goal uh, and you'd have to say that that had a lot to do with Clayson de Lima, but honestly, the soccer's also made some really good shots in the first half. No one was going to stop the power play goal. No one was going to stop the child's header, you know? So I, I think it's more of the confidence that an experienced player like Chris Toth brings you and also the ability for Chris Toth compared to Delima, Chris is just so much better with the ball at his feet than almost any other keeper in the league. And while there were two pass back plays in the second half where rule 12, 12 came into play and, and the fury tried to play it back to Toth a second time in a possession, you understand why it's because Chris honestly has better feet than most of the defenders uh, on the Fury club in terms of moving the ball around and playing the ball out of the back uh, of the zone. So I think Toth coming in was huge. I think it, it boosted the confidence for Ontario and I think it helped them to break the press when the soccer's press was really kind of falling apart uh, because as we mentioned, it seemed to be, discombobulated some players on one page some players on another yeah no yeah you're you're right that makes sense and what a that one that goal hurt right there the six six once they tied it up and something felt wrong at that point uh when uh Juan Topete puts in the ball uh to make so, it a six six I was like uh yeah so what what really bothered me and it bothered me when I was being the analyst in the third quarter as Nate Abrea had the play-by-play. -play. It bothered me as I was announcing the game in the fourth quarter. It, uh, overtime's different because it lasted 30 seconds. But parking the bus is a classic tactic in soccer, outdoors. When an overmatched team goes ahead one nothing, and decides they will then spend all of the rest of the game defending, and they will just, because it's so hard to score in outdoor soccer, that they'll just try and win one nothing, right? And if everything goes horribly wrong, they'll tie 1-1. And that that's parking the bus, right? That's putting everyone in the defensive zone and inviting the whole game to be played in your half defensively and seeing what happens. And just assuming that because it's impossible to score in outdoor, that you'll be able to hold them down. You can't hold a team down by just defending in indoor soccer. And what I saw as the third quarter developed into the fourth quarter was I saw the suckers parking the bus. You know, they, they weren't attacking. They weren't possessing at all. I mean, they weren't possessing at all. It was Ontario possession, Ontario possession, Ontario attack, a shot. And then the soccer's would get the ball. They'd try to dribble out of their zone. They'd lose it or they'd just throw a blind punt uh, out of the zone and it would be picked up by, by Ontario and the Fury were able to keep the possession. And, this becomes a water on rock situation of wearing down San Diego. So the suckers were able to defend well for some poor parts of that second half, but they wear down trying to defend Frank Tyu and shut him out back to back games. You wear down. And the club we saw in the fourth quarter and overtime that was turning the ball over in their defensive zone and having those turn into quick goals for Ontario that to me is a tired team that allowed itself to get tired because they were doing nothing but defending. Yeah. No, I can, I can see that. And I mean, they absolutely parked the bus. You could tell right away that, you know, the, the, I mean, the, the last couple of goals from Ontario, it was just pressure, 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 and not being able to get the ball out of the area and then them taking advantage of, you know, us losing. I guess some of the um uh what's the word that I'm I'm looking for? It's just our our um God, I'm losing it. But what what I'm trying to do is agree with you that it it just didn't didn't make sense for us to park the bus 
the way that we did. I mean, we were still able to get two goals in the in the fourth quarter, um, and one of them, of course, was the uh, the uh, goal from Charlie Gonzalez. But it it just didn't it didn't feel like that should have been the way that we should have gone. Like that's not typical soccer to me, especially against Ontario. I should say, especially against Ontario. Uh, I, I didn't like it at all. What you're seeing if you're watching our live broadcast right now on Twitch is the game losing play, the the golden goal in overtime by George DeLeon. And it is the story of a lost runner. And I really think that's the defensive story of the second half is the soccer's midfielders losing their runners in the middle of the field and seeing that come back to kill them. In this particular case, and, and you can go back and watch that again if you're a masochist, Leo has George DeLeon as his runner going down the middle of the field and he peels off. He just turns his head. He peels off. He goes to the wall and DeLeon just runs free from the middle of the floor all the way down into the offensive zone. It's a two V one DeLeon then trips and Tavoy Morgan over chases the ball goes all the way into the wall is in the wrong position. DeLeon is able to stand up and score. And, and it's, I mean, honestly, it's embarrassing that the play, you know, the play isn't, anything to write home about. Um, but I think the bigger issue that the soccer's have to tighten up for Sunday and for round three of six is okay. Clearly Jerry, they've got the formula to shut down Frank Taillou. And just like when you double team a center in basketball, the wings are going to be open, right? When you double team Taillou as a target, there's always a defender open. There's always going to be a defender that's available. And when you really look at where the Fury scored in the fourth quarter and in the second half, Johnny Tepete scores twice and Robert Palmer scores. So three defender goals out of the four that the Fury scored during that run. And I, I think... In part, those are kind of like the shots you're willing to give up. But on the other side, it comes back, Jerry, to that discipline. You've got to stay with your runners. You've got to know where your runners are. Because if you're letting guys run free, they're going to get open cranks down the middle. And I mean, you know, if you give Johnny Tepete a half dozen open cranks down the middle, he's got a really hard shot. He's going to score a goal or two. Yeah. Yeah, it is uh, very interesting to see Robert Palmer with three points in the game. You know, two assists, the goal. Um, he celebrated it, man. He enjoyed that, and oh, yeah. uh, it, <laughs> it was very much, oh, yeah. uh, you know, it was, it was not fun to watch, especially those thirty seconds. It was just a complete breakdown of of the soccer's just completely losing their mind and not, you know, losing the focus. I think maybe that's what I was trying to say in the fourth quarter. Maybe that's the word. It's we lost focus. Yeah, yeah. we completely lost that that focus. Uh, and very disappointed, but. You know, and this is what I'm going to say right now, and I think we agree on this, Craig. It, it's not to say anything bad about Ontario. As a matter of fact, kudos to Ontario because they did their job. They did what they needed yes, to do absolutely. to get the win. But I have to say, and again, it's it's not because of Ontario and, and their performance. San Diego didn't, or Ontario didn't win this game. San Diego lost it. That's what it felt like to me. And again, that I know that sounds probably bad for Ontario. I'm not trying to say that Ontario didn't win. Of course they did. They did what they had to do. But to me, it felt like we did not do our job, so we lost this game. We had it 5-1. How did, how did right. this happen? We allowed it to. Well, last thing then, uh, before we get to our special guest shortly, I want to train to the positive of the result. You know, th there's a lot that the soccers need to correct going into game three and one of them and, and John San Diego 619 in our chat is bringing it up. And, and I think very good idea to bring it up is shot disparity. Uh, when you give up possession to the level that the soccer's are giving up possession, you're going to give up shot disparity as well. And in the second half of Sunday night's game, Ontario outshot San Diego 17 to five. And, and that includes 13 shots in the fourth quarter for the Ontario Fury. So the overall game total was 31-13 shots. 
which is crazy. That means San Diego scored on more than half of their shots uh, on goal, seven out of 13. I mean, not a great day for the save percentage for the Ontario Fury keepers. They don't care. <laughs> they got a win out of it. But last game was 30 to 20 shots in favor of Ontario. So, you know, this is where I'm going to pull a, a piece of good news out of the mess because, you know, I go back to my three years announcing goals games. And there were many, there are many hockey games where one team is just demonstrably better than the other in the numbers, in the basics, you know, and, and things like that outshot 31, 13 outshot 30 to 20. And that's going to beat you over time, right? That's not a winning formula, but the soccer's played that not good second half. They got outshot by 18 on their home floor. They lost the game, but they took it to overtime. Well, what do we care, right? We've never cared about that. In the history of the soccer's, we've never cared. Oh, well, you lost in overtime, so now we're going to give you a, a cookie. Well, we, you, you get a cookie now. You get a cookie. It's called a standings point. You get a standings point. Because we've gone to the hockey style rule of when you get to overtime, instead of three points to one team, zero to the other, both teams get one point and you're playing for that last point. That third point is the one that's up for grabs. So Ontario got a two point win with the soccer's getting a point out of the game, as opposed to a three point win with the soccer's getting nothing. And so the soccer's are in first place. The soccer's yep. have 10 points. The fury have eight points. It's not nine to nine. It's not tied. Soccer's are ahead. Those two, who knows how important those points are going to be going down the road. And as John mentions in the chat, soccer's got four out of six, you know, uh, against the Fury, whereas the Fury got one out of six uh, available uh, in those matches. So that's really solid for San Diego. And when you are horribly outplayed, a game that you really should lose, I don't want to say horribly outplayed, horribly outplayed from halftime on, and, and a game that you should lose. When you get a point, like many times in hockey, that winds up being the point that was the difference that puts you in the playoff and your opponent out or puts you in first and your opponent in second or what have you. You know, those points matter. Um, furthermore, the, the Fury's tiebreaker uh, goes down because they have two regulation wins to the soccer's three regulation wins. So all of those little things may not matter in the long run, it's going to be whatever team is best. But if these two teams are close, if these two teams are as evenly matched as at least Ontario would like to think that they are, Ontario, by the way, does not think that they're evenly matched with the Soccers. Uh, this is on record from their announcers, their podcasters, coming from the organization. Ontario believes they're the best team in the league. They uh, declare themselves as the winners of this year's championship. They said they are championship bound uh, for the season. And uh, it's been said by their announcers multiple times in the year that they don't believe the soccers will make the playoffs or that they will finish in the top half of the MASL West. They've, they've said right, multiple times that the soccers will finish no better than third uh, in the division. So that's Ontario's perspective on San Diego. They don't think very much of the soccers. I think we think more of Ontario. I think we have a lot of respect for, for where Jimmy Nordberg has taken their franchise and, and how much they've improved as a club, um, you know, all due respect. And, and they've got three of the next four in their barn. So maybe they're just going to blow us to pieces and, and dominate each of the next four matchups. Who knows? That's what they think. Um, what I think is that the Sockers and the Fury are probably going to be close most of the year, if not the whole year. So, hey, getting that one point, that might be the one point you need. You never know. Yeah. And, you know, to be fair, Craig, you mentioned about the mentality of Ontario. I think you need to have that mentality as a team, though, right? You want to think like a champion and say, claim you already are the champion and have that mentality. Sure. I mean, it depends on obviously who you are or whatever. But I think, you know, kudos to Ontario. They're they're already they have their mind there. Obviously, that that season didn't go as planned for them. They already felt like they were championship bound. And so now. They, they have to have that mentality and, and they're doing a good job. And we've talked about them and we've sung their, their praises. So now it's up to San Diego to prove them wrong on that end of, of uh, their thought process. But 
Absolutely right. I mean, we are still in first place with 10 points. Ontario uh, in second with eight. Tacoma in six. And uh, Chihuahua, who we haven't seen play yet with their new reinforcements, their new coach, currently sitting in the bottom of the West with zero points. That's where we are right now. And that's what happened on Sunday. Let's welcome in our special guest. We welcome in a player at the bottom of the hour each week here as we come to you live Tuesdays at 5 p.m. on twitch.tv slash San Diego Soccers. And how happy were we to see this man back in the lineup on Sunday running through the O, one of the classic soccers of the modern era. He is a five-time champion in his career, a four-time champion with San Diego. He is Brian Farber. Brian, Craig and Jerry here. Welcome to Soccer's Overtime. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good, good. I mean, oh, you man. know, we'd be better with three points instead of one, but we're good. <laughs> both. <laughs> well, hey, let's start with the really good news. I mean, when I saw you a couple weeks ago, Brian, uh, honestly, I didn't think we'd see you in the lineup till maybe the last few games of the season. Uh, what, what was able to turn around for you to get back? Um, we had a lot of injuries. <laughs> um, it was somewhat experimental. I'm, I'm definitely far from being back. Um, uh, my foot is, I got an MRI results are going to be read this week, but I got the brief of the MRI before the game from the doctors that there's a lot of things going on in my foot. Obviously at this age, you can't avoid, uh, issues like that forever, but never had a foot issue before. So this is a little bit weird. Um, but it's extremely painful. I'm not even able really to walk on it much after the game. It was rough. Um, but, you know, I was trying to contribute and help as much as I could. I was cramping the whole time. I was completely out of shape. I felt horrible. But I was, you know, I was trying to help. I'm just going to say thank you for uh, sucking it up and honestly taking one for the team and going out there because that's that's tough. Um, yeah, we had talked about that too. I was very surprised to, to see you suit up too. And, but very glad at the same time, um, let's start with the bad. Let's get the bad stuff out of the way. Uh, and just kind of, you know, uh, talk on it. And, uh, where did it go wrong? Where did it go wrong on Sunday night? Third quarter, uh, plain and simple, right? You cut it, you build up a lead like that. Honestly, at that point, like they got a scrappy, lucky goal early on. Um, we missed some sitters. Like I think in the first minute we missed two tap ins and it just felt like this was our game. And, uh, at least from my position, right. I haven't really been on the bench with the guys in the first three games of the year. So it just felt like it was smooth sailing third quarter. We came out flat and, um, we don't typically come out that flat in the third quarter, but we were, and we let him get back into it. And then we took a two goal lead again, and then we let him get back into it. So, uh, mistakes cost us some some poor pressured times some uh, I guess maybe some wrong decisions on when to play long and when to play short and it, it bit us uh, so kudos to them for taking advantage and capitalizing on some of those chances and getting their goals and uh, you know it is what it is yeah when I was reviewing film and I'm pretty sure you guys will be reviewing film this week as well uh Two things really stood out to me in the second half, in particular defensively, Brian. One was uh, the success the Fury had with one twos, with give and go plays, uh, and the other was pretty simply guys losing their runners in the middle of the field and and just ball watching, missing a runner, and then you've got guys like Palmer or Topete or in the end De Leon just kind of running down the middle of the field alone. Yeah, the the overtime goal was for sure just kind of a miscommunication. On actually, I think. I think we actually thought it was our ball and maybe the flick that Charlie did and took a deflection and it was actually our ball. And then I think the boy was caught off guard that it wasn't our ball, um, which put us out of position for the quick play. Um, but yeah, absolutely. They got some young guys that like to run. Um, we definitely had some injuries. We lost Felipe during the match. Juan was pretty tight as well. Obviously I was out there for the first time. So wasn't feeling good. I mean, step after step, I was cramping. I was, I should have just pulled myself anyway, but it was, um, yeah, they got, they got a few lucky chances too. They got some random bounces that kind of fell into, into their foot and they got some good follow-ups and some good goals. But to be fair, like that's just the way these guys play. They're a good team. Obviously they, we know that they make a lot of good passes. They do a lot of extra runs and then they feed off of Frank and, um, they put it together in the third and fourth quarter. 
You know, one one thing I wanted to ask, uh, Brian, it's really interesting going over those last two game films because obviously the Suckers uh, have an intentionality to their defense, which is, you know, control Frank Tayu, right? I mean, he's one of the great players in the league. You've got to shut him down. And the Suckers held him without a goal both games. The Fury, in my opinion, have a deep intentionality to their defensive plan as well, which is shut down Charlie Gonzalez and put him to the floor as many times as possible. You know, this is a player that these guys have scrimmaged against more than any other player, uh, you know, but between the two teams, they know him intimately. And Charlie's been able to get going in the fourth quarter. He's been able to get a goal in the fourth quarter of both games, but really the first three quarters have been quiet. How do you think the soccer's can get Charlie a little bit more involved on Sunday? I think that's, um, I don't think it's a personal thing that the guys are going after Charlie. Uh, I think that I think they're boys, right? I think that they have a great relationship from the past and the, all the time that they spend together and there's a respect for Charlie. And, you know, he happens to be wearing the, the blue and yellow of the soccer's now. So you're going to do that no matter who you play against. The fact that they know him so well, the fact that Charlie's such an important part of our team, um, I think just adds to that. I think him getting going sooner is uh, is maybe Charlie still, you know, he's only a few games into his soccer's career. Maybe he's maybe he's not quite aware of how ready we are for him to do his thing, right? We got him here for a reason, and we want Charlie to, to light it up. But Charlie's a total team player. You can see the passes he made. I can specifically remember a ball that he laid off for Christian a couple weeks ago uh, where he could have kept it himself and he chose to try to get Christian involved. And that's the type of player he is. So um, him stepping up in the fourth quarter, two times in a row versus his former team <clears throat> just goes to show you he's very clutch. Uh, he picks and chooses his moments when he wants to try to take over. Uh, we've seen that for years. And I mean, there's a reason why he was the all time leader in goals and assists for that franchise. And uh, yeah, I think that, this next couple of games versus the same team is going to be very interesting to see what Charlie knows what he's capable of doing. And, and maybe we just need to tell him to, to do a little bit more of it. You know, uh, one of the things that we had talked about uh, preseason kind of moving uh, away from, from this game a little bit uh, is something that you're involved with outside of uh, the, well, I, I guess still kind of with the soccer, but uh, you know, with the league itself, which is the match ball. Uh, for the league, uh, and and I've heard some stories of of that was a process for you. Can you kind of uh, tell us what that was like? <laughs> I'm not sure which part you're uh, inquiring about, but uh, yeah, a few years ago, um, I worked at Puma, and I was like, "Why is the MASL ball made by somebody else?" At the time, it was the MISL, and then the PASL, and the transition that was happening, and I was like. I work for this soccer company. It should be, a, I should own this. So I convinced the people at Puma to allow me to make this ball for the league. And I did. And I built it, designed it, sat down with our global design team. And we created a really unique indoor ball with slight reduced bounce and cool graphics that tied into it and using the dimple technology from Puma. And the ball was really well liked. And then I left Puma and I went to skills and then, um, eventually the ball was taken by miter and we were an afterthought as a, as a league, we were an afterthought. It just, it is what it is. They gave us an off the shelf design and they made it yellow. Uh, they didn't really put any thought to it. The only reason the ball was yellow is because I chose yellow previously uh, to make sure that we didn't go back and tie into the MISL, MASL days of red and orange. Um, I wanted it to be PSL and, and yellow. And uh, when, when I remade it, uh, recently, the conversation was, we're going to take this from Miter. I actually went to, this is a good story for the, for our league, for anybody who has questions about our ball and the thought about went into it, I went to uh, the Miter booth at the U.S. Soccer Coaches Convention two years ago, and it was 50 balls laid across the table. And I said, oh, where's the, uh, where's the, where's the MASL ball? Like, it's not here. And the guy goes, <clears throat> I didn't think anybody would care. And I said, well, you're wrong. Uh, you didn't bring it, huh? And he's like, nope. I was like, oh, well. Uh, and I so I started talking, having a conversation with the guy, and I'm like checking out all the other soccer balls. I'm like, oh, what's this ball? And it was like a unique panel, cool texture. It was a nice, technical, modern soccer ball. 
like one that you don't typically see from from the brand. I'd never seen it before. And he said, oh, I, I said, well, what's this? And he goes, oh, that's a special, special ball we made for a group in Europe. And I was like, you're at the U.S. Soccer Coaches Convention and you have a European special ball sitting front and center at your table. It's not even offered to anybody here. And then you didn't bring the MASL ball, which is a professional league that you own here in the States. I'm very confused by your tactics. But it showed me that these other brands just didn't care. So I was in Australia with Phil and with Craig and we were at the World Cup and we were talking about the new ball agreement was coming up for renewal. And I said, let's let's just make it. And I had a friend who, who owned this ball company and um, we started going down the path of making it with him. And we made the ball. We tried to we tried to make it as good as we could for the league. But we had a very, very short period of time. We made one sample. Everybody liked it. We ordered it. Um, that ball last year was great. The star panel ball was great, but it had its flaws. It was slippery uh, right out of the bag, which is pretty normal. It's a polyurethane cover. Uh, but well, Savage certainly... had some history with that, with the ball being slippery, as I remember. <laughs> the durability of that ball was also uh, something that we questioned the factory on. And yes, I know the story. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and I knew, I knew, but it was, it was what it was. But at the same time, I'm speaking to, I don't know, 20, 30 former players, current players, friends of mine, teammates, guys in other cities. And I'm asking and I'm, I'm poking and prodding and making sure that I understand what's the best indoor ball they've ever played with. Um, and then Tozer comes along this year as our new commissioner. And we had lots of conversations around what do we want the indoor ball to be? And I think it's a significant difference between um, – Last year's ball, which was normal bounce, somewhat normal bounce, slight reduced, but it had a lot of foam to this year's ball, which is a reduced bounce. And I can I can see it. I've actually only kicked the ball now in one game from my own first time because I was really I haven't played soccer in three months. So the other night's game was my first time really touching our ball and a couple of training sessions prior. And it, it's definitely different and noticeable. The texture is high quality used in a lot of pro leagues, but the reduced bounce keeps the ball in play. We've had so many less balls go wide or off the glass. They take one bounce and hop over the wall. Normally, those balls would just pop out into the stands, the front two rows. Everybody's, you're already running off because you can already see the angle and you already know that's going out of bounds. Now the ball's staying in play and the defender's stepping up and the pressure's coming forward and, and you're creating more opportunities for both directions of play. Whoever gets there first, whoever reads the ball best. And we're keeping the ball um, moving. And I think that that's part of our game. Now I've spoke to certain guys around the league that have said, you know, I, I wish it bounced a little bit more, or I, I just can't figure out how to strike it as well as I used to be. Um, but I think those guys are also adjusting to it pretty well from the game tape that I've seen. Um, and also I want everybody to make sure they know we're optimizing constantly and we're already working on another iteration of it. And um, when it comes, we can discuss it again on here how it's like love it awesome well you know i i, I see the combination brian of the ball and the goalkeeper rule as really being something that's added to a, a faster paced league now because first of all you've got the ball on the feet of skill players more often than goalkeepers you know and, and we had a talk earlier in the podcast about how that kind of hurts ontario because chris toth probably has as much foot skill as most field players uh in the league but Nonetheless, generally, it's going to be a higher level of skill. Having that extra weight, having that extra ability, it seems to me, maybe just anecdotally, that the players who really have good touch are starting to put even fancier moves on the ball. I mean, we've seen Leo undress guys back-to-back -back games. We've seen, quite honestly, Justin Stinson undress guys back-to-back -back games, which is really silky moves. And is, is it fair to say that the combination of the ball being on the feet of skilled players more plus a more controllable ball equals maybe a, a more quality product. Yeah, I, I think that we've seen a pretty big difference in the way that the players are able to control this ball out of the air, on the ground. Um, I, I, I've definitely seen it, right? I Immediately when the ball showed up in my first sample, the, I bounced it the first couple of times. I was playing around with it and we knew that this was likely the ball we were going with. And I immediately was in my head imagining Nick Pereira's voice 
and speaking to me about like this ball better not be slippery again because of last year. And, um, and then seeing, you know, guys like Leo and Brandon and Stinson and, and all the guys in the East coast that have incredible skill and the Brazilians, we want those players in our league and our sport to excel <clears throat> and we didn't want to hold them back. So, um, that was a big difference in, in selecting this outer material to make sure that the players are, are capable of doing what they want with the ball and not held back. And then the bounce, keeping it in play, like you said, um, the goalkeeping rule is out of my hands, but uh, definitely a different conversation to be had. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm sure that it's all, it's all been creating, I think, shorter games because the ball leaves the field less. Um, but I don't know. Somebody would have to give me the stats on the realistic or the actual numbers on if the games are shorter or not, because I've seen the ball in play a lot more. Well, and scoring's up too, but that's just because Tacoma got 15 last game. So uh, we'll, we'll take the statistical samples and we'll wait till mid season uh, before we make any choices. Brian, you've been really generous with your time, uh, giving us lots of time here today. Uh, stay healthy or get healthier is what I'm kind of hearing. Uh, you know, keep on that path uh, so that we can see a super productive uh, Farby, uh, Farbizi at the end of the year. And uh, best of luck to the club this Sunday in Ontario. That's where I'm going to leave it with you is, is the importance of this match. It's a best of three. So, I mean, fair to say you guys have chopped the first two. This is the one, right, that sets the tone? Yeah, it's an important match for both teams. Obviously, in our mindset, yeah, us going on the road, I think we play better on the road as a club, less distractions. Um, so it should be, should be good for us to stay focused um, throughout the four quarters. But... Obviously, it's, uh, you know, those guys wanting to to get a repeat of what happened last year in the finals and make a statement to the league. I think that they were pretty thrilled with their victory the other night by the celebrations. Um, and kudos to them. It was an overtime win over the soccer. I mean, it's a big deal. So and I heard you guys before I came on saying that they're making claims to win the championship this year. I haven't I haven't heard that. I try not to listen to that kind of stuff. But yeah, you said it right. Everybody should have that mentality. Nobody goes into the season thinking like, oh, well, let's see how this year goes. If you don't go into the season trying to win a championship, there's something wrong with you mentally. So we're on the same boat. And um, I would I love that the people are picking them and let us float under the radar. I mean, we're the ones with the targets on our back defending champions. Uh, but if they're going to take all that notoriety, let them have it. Yeah, why not? Hey, you're the third place team. You're the third place team, Brian. Exactly. Yeah. We're we're barely gonna make the playoffs. So let's uh let's just let it stay like that for a while. That way. <laughs> I, love it. I like it. Farbs, have a great night. The best to you and your family. Uh stay well. We'll see you at practice tomorrow morning. All right, guys. There he is. The one and only number seven, the flash man, Brian Farber. You know, it's so crazy. I think as a casual fan, you don't think about uh the ball itself being so important and the way that Brian Farber talks about it and how he puts it into perspective, like how important it actually is and the little tiny details and everything that goes into it. I'm not lying to you. I have a thousand percent more respect for somebody that builds that and that is in charge of doing that. And, and uh, also, I mean, I already had a ton of respect. I don't think I could have more for the man, but for him to have gone out there and played, and you heard what he was going through still, that's a team player. That's somebody that's saying, well, my team needs me right now, and I'm going to put them first, and he did. And so, I mean, God, got to love Brian Farber, man. What a legend. You know, the thing about plantar fasciitis is that it is truly, and I, I can speak from experience, okay, as somebody who dealt with it for the better part of two years, uh, it's a purely pain-based injury like there's there's essentially nothing you can do for plantar fasciitis other than don't walk or run for like months okay and nobody can do that <laughs> so you're always like irritating the injury it's always painful literally the first step you take out of bed is one of the most painful steps you take all day uh and when you run, I can tell you that for about a half a mile, it's excruciating step-by-step -step pain. And then it slowly numbs out 
as you continue to pound it. And then eventually it'll come back later in the day. But for a pro athlete to have that type, you know, have knives and it feel funny thing is too, it's actually in the bottom of your foot, but it represents in your heel. It represents like someone stabbing a needle in your heel or, oh. or putting a hot poker on your heel. Cause it's a burning sensation. It's like someone putting a hot poker on your heel over and over again. Something. And, and as, as Gabe is saying in the, in the chat, there's all sorts of remedies, you know, for a long time, I wore gel inserts, uh, you know, uh, uh, under your arches to try and, and flatten things out. People wear socks that stretch your toes. There's all sorts of different things uh, that you can do, but short of it breaking, which sometimes happens, short of the plantar fascia breaking the tendon in the bottom of your foot, you just ache forever. And it never goes away. But you can, for me, it was over a year later that it started to go away. And then I, I went to the zoo uh, earlier in 2021 and we walked all day long and my heel started burning again. Mm, I, I don't want to. Like, don't, don't come back. Don't you dare come back on me, plantar fasciae. I just screw you. Don't you come back on me. You know, and, and uh, it, oh. it, it didn't all the way come back. But I know if I was running every day, it would come back. So, you know, as you said, kudos to Brian. It's just one of the absolute hardest injuries to get over. It's just a long, long term situation. Yeah, and see, the, the, it looks like it's a you know a few people have gone through it too, along with you. It looks like uh, S Barber fifty five there, also had to go through some physical therapy, some some custom uh, ortho and uh, orthotics. Yeah, that's uh, the, orthotics. orthotics is that word. That's the that's the word. I don't know words today. I can't. It's all good. Break. I has the dumb. Don't worry. This is a this isn't a conversation based medium at all. We're good. Um, <laughs> all right, let's let's move it along, buddy. I think I gotta go. Let's move it along. Let's move it along. If you're watching, you see over my left shoulder and my right shoulder the media game kits from Sunday, and uh, the passion project of the last month for me, Jerry, as you know, has been the soccer celebrity media game. Uh, it was. One of the tougher weeks of my professional career here in, in San Diego with the Sockers uh, to try and do this in the midst of an Omicron surge. We turned over more than half of the celebrity roster from Tuesday to Sunday. Oof. Nonetheless, we got ourselves a game. And I think we got ourselves the highest scoring, most athletic celebrity media game in soccer's history, Jerry, a, a 5-1 light blue team blowout win over Navy in 10 minutes of play. It was such a fun game. It was honestly, and we had discussed this, right? Hey, should we do, I think you, I think you actually asked the boys over at Two Balls and a Mic, should we do like a regular 5-on-5 five five with goalkeeper, you know, 6-on-6, six six, or just like it normally would be everybody against everybody. And in this situation, I think it worked out really well. And the way that you spread out the the talent, too, at the end of the day, obviously, with all the changes and everything, man, great job. I think you did a fantastic job. And it was so much fun. And by the way, I heard from multiple people that they looked at the lineup and they were not expecting the, the light blue team to do as well as it did. They thought Navy was going to be the top dog. Well, no. Uh it was not to be. <laughs> it was not to be. And there were two, two main reasons. Three, three. Let's go three stars of the game. There were three yep. main reasons for that. So, I, I, you know, as you know, Jerry, I'm a very honest person. I try to be a very honest broadcaster. So let's be honest first and say that Sal Zizo is a bit of a ringer for the celebrity media game. He's a bit of a ringer for this game. He is in the media. He is the host of a soccer podcast. Uh, yes. you could call him a celebrity, which is very fair because he's the first ever, the original, uh, San Diego loyal. Uh, so he's got that going for him too. Uh, <laughs> with that though, uh, he was really, really good <laughs> on Sunday. He was dominating. He scored a goal. Uh, he had several assists. He was controlling the ball. He was moving. He was looking good. And I said it on the mic, and I said it in the email I sent him today. Sal, have you thought about coming out to training? Have you considered the idea so, so I was, of coming uh, out to training? 
I was standing next to him before we went in uh, in the tunnel, and I said, "Hey, so so take it easy on them, number one, and number two, we have a soccer's uniform ready for you, so you can come in for the second half." And he's like, "Oh, really?" <laughs> and, I, and I winked at him like, "Hey, <laughs> so I'm already putting it out there." But yeah, man, he's he's absolutely. I mean, he's not very far away from. Uh, you know, having been retired. So he's still, he's still very much got it. And you could tell he was taking it super easy on everybody. Like he was sure. having fun. He was having fun. He looked really, really good. Yeah. Um, he did. Like really good. Uh, next, we have to bring up Cabana Boy Jeff, the, the host of 933, the first ever hat trick in the history of the media game. And it wasn't like he knocked in a couple of lousy scramble goals. I mean, he banged in some shots from the crease. There was some really good goals. I was so impressed. I don't think anybody, ex I think everybody knew, and you, you mentioned, you know, you'll get the invite if you score a goal. And did Cabana Boy, uh, did Jeff actually score last year? I, I'm or pretty sure he had a goal in the last game, yes. Okay, okay. So I, I was not expecting three from him. The man has moves. <laughs> he, he put the ball in the back of the net three times and it wasn't like flukes. It was good goals. It was really good goals. Honestly, uh, he, he did an amazing job and you know, Sal was setting up, up a little bit. His teammates were setting him up and he was cashing it in. He was the tie of the halftime game. You know I mean? He was, he was just crushing it. I mean, I should really say like the Tavoy of the halftime game because I mean, Frank didn't score. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> Cabana boy Jeff scored three times. Holy crap. But, and now we get to Tony Sanchez because the co-host of two balls and a mic jumped at the opportunity to be keeper posted videos of himself as keeper on social media, talked up his performance on the two balls and a mic media game preview podcast. And all he does is come out give up only one goal, save Shannon McMillan like four times, probably one time, a one-handed diving save, throw distributions like, like this guy, like Sultan Toth. He was out there hucking the ball just short of three lines. Incredible stuff. Tony Sanchez, holy crap. Like soccer's too. Should we be calling you for a goalkeeping opportunity? He looked pretty damn good. He did. And he put up with some fouls too from, I hate to say it, Drew. That was not nice. That was a blue. Easy. We didn't have enough time though for a two minute. That, that wouldn't have been fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but what was that? Uh, no, it was fantastic. Fantastic work from Tony. And that's one of the things you don't want to do, right? It's hype yourself up so much that people are like, okay, you better, you know, you have to perform basically is what right. he made yeah. it. He made it to where he had no choice, but he came in confident. He delivered. He knows his skill. And I mean, against Shannon McMillan, what? It, did you go back and watch that footage of that save? It's all over social media. Now we're never going to hear the end of it, but that's okay because he did such a good job and he deserves the praise. So if you haven't already, go tell Tony how impressed you were because he deserves it. Fantastic work from uh, Team Light Blue. <laughs> Fantastic work. Great job by everyone all the way around. I want to say a special thanks to all of the celebs and media members who jumped in late and, and who filled in for people who caught COVID. And I mean, you know, I, I said it on banter last night on the Padres Hot Tub podcast, but like more people in my personal circles and more people in my social circles caught COVID last week than in all the weeks of COVID prior to that combined. So uh, it, it just, absolutely ran its way through the media game lineup. And I want to say really a big heartfelt thanks to everyone who stepped up. Uh, and in particular, I want to say thanks to yourself, Jerry, to Travis Peterson, guys who helped me behind the scenes, who I deputized to, to bring some people in uh, and to the great folks at San Diego loyal who jumped up guys like Weston Bray, guys like Danny Miller, you know, uh, and Lizzie Rivas from San Diego wave FC uh, and X of loyal you know, kind of jumping into the fray there. We love our partnerships with our fellow pro uh, soccer clubs here in San Diego. We're so excited to see those partnerships grow. And it was really cool to see a lot of great loyal run uh, in the halftime game too. 
yeah no i'm really looking for i'm already looking forward to the next next one it was a lot of fun let's do it all right let's get to some more soccer's news i've got are you ready are you ready for some good news let's i got go. some good news I always for take good news soccer's fans we've been asked the question oh so many times And the answer now is an unqualified yes. Yes, you can buy all the Soccer's merch available at the merchandise stand on our online shop. Go to sdsockers.com slash shop. So if you are an out-of-towner and you want a Kevin Crow or a Kaz Dana or a Julie V or like I'm wearing right now, a Zoltan Toth throwback, a Paul Wright, you know, uh, we a uh, Gene Wilrich, we've still got them all. If you want one of the new home jerseys, the blue with the diagonal stripe home jerseys, if you want a blank retro jersey that you could custom order yourself, all of that, plus all of the different hoodies, the new championship gear, all of our gear. If you can buy it at the merch stand on a Sunday at Pachanga Arena, you can now buy it, Jerry, online, sdsockers.com slash shop. Get in there. Get buying. Do understand that shipping will be, it's not Amazon, okay? We've got Ezra Burdett working essentially as a one-woman show uh, in terms of redemption uh, on this. There's Ezra right there, her smiling face. But uh, so much new stuff that wasn't available Sunday is available today. And Jerry is streaming, is scrolling through it right now. You can see the online shop if you're watching us uh, on twitch.tv slash San Diego soccer. So everything is available. John San Diego 619 in the chat is leading me right to one of my very next points. Okay. You asked, we ordered. At the next home game, there will be soccer's masks. Okay, we have 100 navy blue soccer's masks with the 15 star crest, and we have 100 navy blue soccer's masks with the Kicking K classic logo. Both will be here by our next home game, after which they will be available online. So as we've learned, oh, we're done with masks. We don't need masks. No, we we still need masks. And we'll probably still need them next winter. You know, and and we'll need them here and there as you and and sometime you'll be feeling sick and you'll have a mask that you'll be able to put on and you'll be able to represent your San Diego Soccers at the same time. So uh, stay tuned for that. Masks are coming. Masks have been ordered. They are on the way. Uh, Speaking of which. Did you notice the state of California extended the mask mandate to February 15th? Yeah, unfortunately, I did. Here we are. So okay. that's going to cover three of three more home games. We were kind of wow. hoping that 25% of the schedule uh, would be uh, covered by the mandate. Now it's 50% of the schedule. Mm-hmm. I'm really hoping that in two weeks, in three weeks, when our game is that we're going to be on the ba- on the downside of this thing, that we're going to be way at the foothill of the bottom of the curve and that people aren't going to be as nervous anymore uh, about being at the game, being, you know, uh, being there. And uh, Gabe, wait for the next run. Maybe we'll have a Ron Newman Cup championship mask. Uh, I just tell you what I was told, and that's what was ordered. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, nonetheless, they'll be there. They'll, they'll, they'll be available for you. Okay. Um, hey, the state does what the state does. We, we comply. You know, we're a public organization. We have to put everyone's public health first. So uh, that's what we'll do as a pro sports organization. And we love all of our fans that have been supporting us through this horrible time. Uh, (laughs) 30 second digression. You've seen me in various states of depression, Jerry, at night, at various points after games, just being so sad because, I mean, look, the attendance isn't where we want it to be. Isn't where anyone wants it to be. There's so many different factors that people can't see from the outside that that it it becomes almost impossible for us on the inside to try and really get the message out the right way. Uh, uh, Let me give you one simple example of some of the things that are challenges for us right now as an organization. When I came back to the soccer in 2018, one of my absolute expressed goals was to get us back in the community as much and as often as possible, because not only is it important to get yourself out in front of kids, in front of parents, in front of schools, churches, organizations, 
Kiwanis Club, whatever. But also, that's how you find groups. And groups are what create attendance. All right. You got to have groups to have attendance. When I first came to the Soccers in 2018, they had four public appearances. We turned that in 2019 to 15 public appearances. Then we hired John Green to be our full time community director. He took over, did incredible work. And in 2019, 2020, we were set to do 45 public appearances. Okay. Then COVID hit. It's been 22 months since the soccer's last public appearance in terms of going out to a school, going out to a church group, going out to some organization. And it's the decay of stuff like that that puts us in the spot where we don't have the groups that are available to come. Never mind having the fact that most of our major soccer clubs that we lean on are saying, you know what, we want to wait. We, we just want to wait. We want to wait till the back half of the season so we can bring a hundred kids to the game and just really feel comfortable that we're doing that, you know, and it's not the same in other States. It's not the same in other situations, but I will tell you that every arena team and you might go, Oh, well, the goals are doing so much better or, Oh, the seals are doing so much. better. First off, don't believe the numbers you read in general. Second off, Understand everyone is experiencing something around 50 to 60% no-show, straight no-show. Buy a ticket, don't show up. And that's what we had the last game. You know, And we had well over 1,000 tickets distributed, and people don't, don't show up because they don't want to get sick. I get it. Half the people in my life got sick last week. So th that's just one example. There, there are another 10 that I could give you of the things that our small club is trying to do to overcome this horrible situation. And just please thank you for your support of the San Diego soccers. And everyone is in this together. I said this to you guys on the field before the ring ceremony, we're all in this together. We are all defenders of this tradition. And it means doing something a little bit more than being an average fan, right. And just coming to the game and being excited. It means, being a proselytizer, going out and selling the religion of the San Diego Soccers to other people and, and trying to build this back up because we're coming out of a hole that would have folded almost any other franchise that wasn't owned by a, a great man like Phil Salvaggio. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It's 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 an ongoing struggle. We've got a lot of people who are not happy with, with where things are right now. But at the same time, when you really break it down, Jerry... <laughs> It's impossible to do this stuff in the middle of a pandemic. And, and I really feel like our small group and you are a big part of that. My friend have done at, we're doing everything we can. Oh, a hundred percent. And we will continue to do so. And uh, hopefully those that do listen and that are there, uh, you know, that have been there and continue to be there. will hopefully continue to be there and, and, and give us a hand and, and bring some friends and show them what a great time it is. Uh, you know, we we will continue to push. We'll continue to move forward and uh, continue, like you said, uh, defending this this tradition of of championships of winning in the city of San Diego. Uh, regardless, I'm I'm happy to contribute uh, to it in a, in a small part, and I will continue to do my best. Sometimes it feels like I don't do enough, you know, but we continue to push forward. I think that's a good feeling to have. Like I, like I said, you want to expect more from yourself, and you keep pushing forward. Um, and it's people like uh, the ones listening right now that that continue to want us to push forward uh, even through the really tough times uh with that being said craig we do have some pretty cool specials coming up very very soon and a game that i think a lot of people are looking forward to one of my favorite i have to say of the year okay so let's talk about the next homestand real quick and then we'll get into a, a couple other notes and we'll get out of, get out of here but uh okay. the soccer's have a four game road trip coming up right sunday in ontario the following weekend, two games, Friday, Saturday in Chihuahua. More on that in just a moment. The following Wednesday, back in Ontario, Wednesday the 26th. And then Friday, January 28th, 7.35 p.m., <laughs> the Soccers and the Tacoma Stars, and it is Star Wars Night. Absolutely actually locked in legal agreement signed everything it is star wars night lucasfilm official production for the soccers and the tacoma stars the soccers will be in mandalorian themed uniforms we will have all the cosplayers out uh from 
the you know the 500 first battalion and and uh and all the rest of the great san diego uh star wars fan groups out and part of the on-field presentation part of the game day presentation i will have all the clips all the music you know in the arena and of course uh, part of the fun of Star Wars night, Jerry, is that the players in those incredible Mando and Baby Yoda kits, not Boba Fett themed, uh, Sea Dog, Mandalorian themed. We're going for the popular quality Disney Plus show, the number one Disney Plus show of all time. <laughs> We're going where the money is, all right? We're going where that sweet, sweet cash is, all right? Um, and those jerseys, the game worn jerseys, uh, of the players will be available on live source for auction. So you can get your Craig Childs jersey or your Farber or Pino or, or Tavoy Morgan or Boris Pardo or whoever you want. Uh, soccer's jersey, you can bid outbid the rest of the group for it. And the benefits go to the San Diego Food Bank. So in ordering that jersey, in bidding for that jersey, you're helping our homeless issues here in San Diego by benefiting an incredible organization, the San Diego Food Bank, who especially in the winter are just so desperately needed uh, in, in order to keep people healthy and keep people fed. So Star Wars night, January 28th, Friday night. However, Jerry, it is a two-game weekend mm -hmm. because on Sunday, 5 p.m., January 30th, the soccer's host for the first time ever, Utica City FC. Utica City coming from upstate New York across the country uh, to San Diego, California to play. It's first responders night. The soccer's will be giving away a water bottle to the fans in attendance. Now, it is common knowledge that when you have a game on Friday and you have a game on Sunday, that most people say, well, I'm going to go to one of those games. Well, I'm going to go to Friday's game. Then I'm going to skip Sunday. Or I'm going to go to Sunday's game, but I'm going to skip Friday. The Sockers would desperately like you to come to both. And here's what we're doing to make that happen. Okay? Here's what we're doing to make that happen. If you buy a full-priced GA or Loge ticket to Friday's Star Wars night game, you will receive a free ticket to Sunday's game against Utica. All right? Buy one get two. Buy one ticket to Friday's game, get a ticket to Sunday's game. Get the same ticket to Sunday's game. What a deal. Two games for the price of one. But there's more. But wait, but there's, there's more. more. <laughs> I know from research and statistical fact that when you give somebody a ticket to a game, they're less likely to attend than if they purchase a ticket to a game because they didn't have a financial investment in the game. So I would like to give you a financial investment in your free ticket to Sunday's game. So please follow along. You buy the full price ticket to Friday's game. Lows your GA. You get the same ticket to the Sunday game. That comes with an email. All right. You come to Sunday's game. Boom. Loyalty reward. Loyalty reward, $10 credit at the merch stand that night. Okay, straight $10 credit, not $10 off on a purchase of whatever, $10 credit at the merch stand. So we're going another mile for you. Okay, buy that ticket to Friday. You get a free ticket to Sunday. Use your free ticket on Sunday. We give you another $10 in credit at the Soccer's merch store to be used that day in arena only okay this is a loyalty reward weekend from the san diego soccers to our fans and honestly what a deal man you can buy a 20 dollars ticket get another 20 dollars ticket and get 10 dollars at the merch stand it's basically 50 bucks for 20 bucks yeah it's quite a deal plus you didn't mention giveaway water bottle on sunday as well for utica city so and a water bottle Probably one of the most fun nights you're going to have with Star Wars Night that Friday. Then you get a water bottle on Sunday, $10 to the merch booth, and a free ticket. Like, If you can do it, you need to be there. You need to be there. SDSockers.com slash tickets. Call 866-799-GOAL. Talk to Spencer. Get the deal. Okay. Call. Get the deal. 866-799-GOAL. John San Diego, 
That's a great question. How about us as season ticket holders? What about us, my dude? Well, you know what, John? As a season ticket holder, you get the best price of anybody. You get a deal on every single ticket that the person paying full price does not. You get 15% off the merchandise stand every single day, preferred parking. And just please understand this. You are our most important valued customer, the season ticket member. We're trying to make more of you. <laughs> We're <laughs> trying to create more of you. We need more of you. Please help support us in this effort as maybe we dangle a little something to get some extra people in the house. We'll always take care of our season ticket holders. We always, always will. Um, John also asked the question for Utica, is Slavisha coming? Yeah, I mean, unless they don't put him on the plane, Slavisha Obeperapovic is coming. Uh, and it'll be his first time to square off against the team that, you know, he's pretty upset with uh, because that team let him go uh, during the playoffs last year. So, you know, uh, I personally uh, think, you know, a lot and think highly of Slavisha. Uh, you know, he's somebody who was personally always really great to me. Uh, he wasn't very happy with me for some reason at the end of the broadcast uh, last year of the finals. I don't remember saying anything about Slavisha. Nonetheless, uh, hey. Drama, man. I like drama. I like storylines. And Slav versus the soccer is just like Charlie versus the Fury. You know, I mean, these are the fun kind of things for us to chew on, man. Yeah. I uh, I, I love Slavisa. I think he was super nice. And like, you know, talking to him, he was, he was a great dude. I mean, whatever happened, happened. Uh, I hope he comes in and still puts up, you know, a fight. I, I, I would hope he's going to do his best and going to put on a show. Uh, hopefully not in, you know, thinking back to that time so yeah i'm excited to see him back here uh wearing the utica city uh crest uh against us hopefully he doesn't do all that great <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say uh but utica has uh, been struggling man they're two and they four have. uh yeah. you know th admittedly they've been playing florida and baltimore you know i mean they've been playing really good teams uh nonetheless they've been losing those games and yeah. Uh, not really that close. And they played a Florida team that was missing about half their team uh, on Sunday, and they, they still lost and, and really got shut down. So uh, not a great yeah. start to the year for Utica. And, hey, uh, I hope that continues <laughs> because uh, we need a dub. You know, we need some dubs here, and uh, that would be a good one to get. Uh, last thing here on Soccer's News, just a reminder, a, a repeat, a reminder, that next weekend – uh, the weekend of the 21st and the 22nd, the Soccers will be in Mexico. They'll be playing Chihuahua. And I believe this is the first time Sea Dog ever that the Soccers played Utica. I don't think they played on the road ever before, but I might be wrong about that. Um, okay, so when the Soccers play in Chihuahua, Friday, 7 p.m. on the 21st, Saturday, 6 p.m. on the 22nd, those games on MASL TV on YouTube, of course, will be... Spanish language broadcasts. They will be from the home announcer in Chihuahua. However, here on Twitch, Jerry and I are offering you the opportunity to have an English language broadcast of the soccer's Chihuahua matches. So Jerry and I will be live right here on twitch.tv slash San Diego soccers with the game broadcast for you Friday at 7 PM, Saturday at 6 PM. We will be picking up the Mexican feed from Chihuahua, we will be playing it on our feed without sound, and then Jerry and I will be adding our sound uh, over the top of it. A Manning cast? An Elston cast? I mean, yeah, that's <laughs> that, that, that's that's what it is. That's that's the idea. That's that's the idea. So uh, join us. We'll be doing that live from the Calafino Lounge uh, up in Carlsbad. We might invite some select supporters to join us. In the lounge in Carlsbad. If you're a supporter, you know what you need to do. Uh, and we're going to be there live broadcast. I'm really excited for this, Jerry, because I think it's one of the biggest complaints we've gotten in the past is people saying, hey, you know, you guys go down to Sonora or you guys go down to Monterey and now Chihuahua. And we don't even want to watch the game because we don't understand you know, the language of what's going on. Well, you can either learn Spanish or you can tune in to twitch.tv slash San Diego soccer. I just hope my words are back by then. That's all. I just want my words to be back. <laughs> Today is not the day for me. It's okay. They'll be back. I, I, I mean, tequila will be around, so maybe they'll 
be there for the first quarter, and then we'll see. We'll see what happens. There could Tune be in. a progressive, uh, yeah, <laughs> dropping of words. Uh... <laughs> you don't want to miss it. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Watch us here on Twitch. Uh, we've got some still very exciting stuff to talk about in the last eight minutes of this podcast. Um, but I want to throw out a uh, quick because I see it in the chat. S Barber fifty five saying any watch parties for other away games. There will be uh, S Barber fifty five, but stay tuned. It's not going to be right away. It's not going to be in the month of J- month of January. Uh, we're we're looking at probably a couple of March uh, viewing parties. Why? So we can get on the other side of this thing. You know, it, we just want to get on the other side of this thing, and you know what that thing is. Uh, okay. Quickly, some MASL news. St. Louis fires their head coach. Greg Muir, gone. The owner and GM, Jeff Locker, takes over as interim head coach. Ambush fans cry bloody murder. The ambush go to Tacoma and win. Ambush fans start to think things are okay. Then Sunday comes around and they're down something like 11-0. Definitely not okay. Uh, <laughs> not okay. <laughs> and lose 15 to 5 uh on, on Sunday. So yes. I I have no intel here, Jerry. I don't know what went wrong. I know that Everton Marrera was their previous head coach and, and I thought was building something there. Uh, you know, he left at the end of last season. They, they bring in Greg Muir. Uh, the team wasn't doing horribly. They were 500 ish or a game under 500. Uh, really quick hook. And I mean, let's see. One game in, I thought, okay, maybe this was a positive move. The next game, I thought, okay, the ambush are done. They're not going to make the playoffs. So, uh, mm-hmm. well, we, I guess there's nothing but time to figure that out. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, it was 15 1, but it's, you know, they ended 1 1 1. I mean, one for each team. Uh, on the actual standings, that's what really, I mean, well, the goal differential. Never mind. I take that back. Uh, you did say, though, that Greg uh, Muir was fired, but he resigned. Is that correct? I just want to make sure. We oh, I, I think you're right about that. Yeah, I think he yeah. tendered his resignation. Yeah. But again, still, still doesn't, I mean, doesn't help the situation whatsoever. It's just very interesting what's going on. Uh, there's some teams that have been just very surprising this season already. But, this is why I try to keep my expectations low in, in the MASL. I think especially because anything is possible. Anything can happen. We saw it last season and here we are again, a team like Milwaukee wave again, not quite what we were expecting uh, for me, a team like uh, St. Louis, absolutely not what I was expecting. And Tacoma just really took it to them. And that was, I saw that scoreline. I thought, I thought it was a misprint. I thought somebody messed up and it was actually one five, you know, or that sort of, or <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> uh. Let's go back to Chihuahua really quick. Uh, our general manager, uh, Jerry, Sean Bowers just, I mean, sent me uh, some information that was put out on Twitter by the government of the state of Chihuahua in Mexico. Uh as of yesterday, Chihuahua uh, has been placed by the Mexican federal government into what they call orange alert. Uh, and that orange alert will be from January 10th to the 23rd. Quite importantly, covering the weekend of the San Diego Soccer's Chihuahua Savage matches uh, down in Chihuahua. Uh, and the Post, I'm just going to read the post to you. The Mexican state of Chihuahua on an orange alert from January 10 to 23 due to a new wave of COVID Omicron. Soccer is a non-essential activity. And the question that arises is whether there will be a game in Chihuahua or would San Diego soccer's prefer to move the game to another venue? Uh, And then this person speculates, would they look for a forfeit from Chihuahua or could the El Paso Coliseum In El Paso, Texas, on the other side of the El Paso Juarez border, former home of the missing Coyotes, could that be a local venue option for Savage in case the game is not held at the corner sports complex uh, in Chihuahua? Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Stay tuned. I like this. Bring it to San Diego and be fair. We'll wear away jerseys. 
<laughs> that's thinking. <laughs> that's thinking, John. Love it. No, that's a bummer. So, oh, yeah, man. stay tuned, right? And I would say just I mean, look, that's that's a that post didn't come from the Chihuahua Savage, so I'm not putting any official weight to that post. But if El Paso's an option, you got to think that's where they're going because Texas will happily host a game. Uh, they don't care uh, uh, about surges or whatnot. But if Chihuahua is going to be locked down, you can't play the game in Chihuahua, period. Yeah. Now, I'm in, I'd be interested to see what the laws are in, in orange. Uh, what did they call it? O- orange. O- orange alert or orange. Alert tier you know you know how we used to have you know, tiers yeah i i wonder what that that is going to, how that's going to affect crossing over the border too though for and for for the team so that's going to have question a yeah yeah great question i don't know uh and, and of course we already know and we've already seen through just two games that the the Chihuahua team that appears south of the border is going to be a very different team from the Chihuahua team that appears north of the border, or at least it appears so at this point when you talk about visas. So, you know, if, and and I'm not even thinking about it this way, guys. All right. I I don't want you to think like, Oh, Craig's trying to think tactically and take advantage of the situation. But I mean, it, it kind of is true that it might not be the same savage team that comes even to El Paso uh, as, as that, what could come to California. It's, Stay tuned. Let's figure it out. I love that yellow card. Uh, we'll find out very, very soon in the next, uh, you know, as of recording right now, if you're listening, maybe it's a bit less than that. But on the 14th of January in three days, Chihuahua is set to uh, go to Milwaukee against Milwaukee Wave. So yeah, they're Friday, supposed to play twice this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, man. Chihuahua getting attacked with all these like back to back games. My goodness. Uh, no, we'll, so we'll find out very soon what's going to happen there. I'm sure they're going to move very quickly. These games are coming up uh, very, very soon. So we'll keep you updated. All right. Last thing, uh, you know, just very, very, very briefly, just headlines. Uh, Kansas City is now 6-0. They're, they're bossing the league uh, right now. Six regulation wins. Uh, Baltimore is on the come. Uh, they came from behind and beat Harrisburg uh, on Saturday. The Heat are 0-3. That's not great. Um, Florida smashes UCFC again. It's really looking, looking right now like it's Florida and Baltimore, and then it's Utica and Harrisburg, and that there's a pretty decent gap uh, between the top two teams and the bottom two teams in the East. So stay tuned uh, as we continue to roll through. Looking at the schedule this coming week in the MASL, uh, on Friday, it's Harrisburg at Florida. On Friday, it's Chihuahua at Milwaukee. It's Blast at Dallas. Uh, that game originally scheduled for 5.30 p.m. It's been moved to 12.30 p.m. Uh, make a note of that. Uh, and the Comets will play in St. Louis against the newly constituted Ambush. On Sunday, it's Baltimore at Utica City FC. It's Harrisburg at Florida again. It's Milwaukee down in Dallas. And it's Chihuahua playing at St. Louis. And, of course, it's the Soccers and Fury at 3 p.m. Kansas City will be in Tacoma, a very, very busy Sunday uh, in the MASL this weekend. But our game, Soccers at Fury, 3 p.m., Toyota Arena. Hope to see a lot of Soccers fans there. Of course, uh, our friends Philly, the Panda, and JR will have the call. Uh, they call him the doctor. I still don't know why. Uh, Jonathan Reimer, our good friend. Uh, why was he the doctor, Jerry? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't want to get it wrong, but he, uh, I think Philly says something about he has a PhD in personality. I think that's what it is. A PhD in personality. Yeah. I like that. I like that. So our friends in in Ontario will have the broadcast and I'm sure they're going to do a great job and we wish them uh, the very best. I will be there on Sunday offering social media, uh, you know, and, and, post-game interviews and everything else uh, from Toyota Arena. So stay tuned. And then, hey, join us back here next Tuesday at 5 o'clock, and we will figure out what's going on with the Chihuahua game. And the very last thing, the very last thing, and we're out of here. What are we doing next Tuesday, Jerry? We're doing episode 100 of Soccer's Overtime. I need to put that in. I need to put that sound in here. Yes. So excited. Getting out of the, I, I don't, I don't like being here in the studio in my house. 
want to get out. Well, let's do it then. Let's get out. We're going to go live to Three Punk Ales Brewing in Chula Vista, California. Jerry and I will be there. Will we be inside? Will we be on the patio? Will we be in the back? I don't know where we're going to be. Let's see how sick everyone is a week from now. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, we will be there and we invite you to join us for our live recording of Soccer's Overtime. We will effort to have a player there live uh, with us as well instead of just on the on the uh, Internet. And it'll be episode 100 all time of Soccer's Overtime. So come on down for the celebration. Steve-O, El Shams will be there. Steve Garcia, uh, Jerry and I will be there. Uh, and we'll do the regular show Tuesday at 5. We'll just be doing it live from uh, Three Punk Ales, 3rd Street in Chula Vista. Come on down and uh, tip one with us. We'll, we'll definitely be drinking beer while we do the podcast next week. Instead, I, I had coffee this week. So, so boring. Yeah, I had a Diet Coke. Coke Zero. Uh, but next week, episode 100. Yeah, if you can make it out, obviously we're going to be as safe as possible, but we would love to see you. Uh, come have a, a, beer, a pint with us at Three Punk Else. No place better and uh, celebrate the 100th episode with us. That's going to be a lot of fun. Well, that's going to bring an end to this week's Soccer's Overtime. We thank everybody who's been watching us uh, from start to finish here on twitch.tv slash San Diego Soccer's. We thank everybody, wherever you're listening, you know, in the U.S., Mexico, Canada, or in Europe, uh, listening to us on the podcast. Jerry, uh, thank you so much. You don't have to go to a home game this weekend. I'll talk to you next Tuesday. (laughs) Well, uh, we'll see you all very, very soon, though. Tuesday. Um, I don't know, man. This month is flying by. So I'm excited to, uh, you know, get a little bit of a break this weekend. But we'll see you very, very soon. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. For Jerry Jimenez, who you can follow on Twitter or Instagram at Cheeto Jerry, C-H-I-D-O-J-E-R-R-Y. I'm Craig Elston. You can follow me on Twitter at 619 Sports. You can follow me on Instagram at 619 Sports and Life. And, of course, follow us at San Diego Soccers on any platform, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Follow us at San Diego Soccers. For Jerry Jimenez, I'm Craig Elston. Thanks for tuning in. You've reached the end of Season 4, Episode 10 of Soccers Overtime. We'll be down at 3 Punk Ales with Episode 100 next week. Until then, have a great week and go Soccers!